I'm glad you're joining us. Uh, we, uh, I do, <laughs> pick series of topics to speak on, and we're in the midst of a series called Did God Really Say? Today's topic is What Are You Building Your Life On? Uh, actually, these first three weeks, we've been discussing the, what's called the Sermon on the Mount, a group of teachings by Jesus. It's recorded at the beginning of his ministry. I think he probably carried them on throughout his ministry. But after the first week, I came to the realization that's probably not the best title for this series, because <laughs> most of us believe, you know, this is what God said. If you don't, that's fine. We're glad you're joining us. But what really is the issue is, and I put it on your outline, if you would like an outline, there's some out there, and you can get it on your phone, is, but what did he actually mean? And we've got thousands of denominations that all believe this is God's word, but we all kind of interpret a little bit different. And so, that's our goal, to try and figure out what he means. So, Jesus, of course. So, we're talking about the law. I believe that the basis of the Sermon on the Mount is the law. He's talking to Jews about how to get into heaven, and they believe he got to heaven by following the law. We would say our Old Testament, all those rules, etc. So, as we looked at the first two weeks, Jesus said, well, you think you can get there by following the law? He said, well, you know, the Old Testament, actually Ten Commandments says you shouldn't murder anybody. He said, well, that's not strict enough. You can't even hate anybody. And it also says don't commit adultery. Well, that's not strict enough. You can't even lust after a woman. And so even if we think, you know, I haven't been unfaithful to my wife physically, but I have been committed adultery in my mind, right? So, Jesus is saying, if you think you can get to God by following the rules, you, you're mistaken. Just good luck in trying to, to keep those rules. He kept raising the bar just to make them understand, this is impossible. I can't get to God by following the rules. In fact, simply put, heaven's a perfect place, and you've got to be perfect to get there. Anybody perfect? Okay. So, that kind of end of the story right there. But he doesn't leave us there. He said, there's a better way. And of course, he's going to say it's through him. So I said, as a conclusion, only when we come to, the, to grips, only as we come to understand the strictness of the law, that it's impossible. All right. If that's impossible, I need something else. We begin to come to grips with the beauty of God's grace. God says, okay, I'll provide a better way. So we're going to jump into chapter 7, and we're going to follow the different categories. Jesus jumps around quite a bit. And um, we'll see what he has to say to us this morning. First part, I don't know how many of you have talked to uh, some people that aren't church, some believers, whatever. Most of them know this verse. People don't go to church and know verses, right, of the Bible. This is one they know. And they'll quote it to you, right, if you start judging them, right? So what's Jesus say here? Do not judge others. Is that what it really means? Bring it up, please. Do not judge others. Well, yes and no. And you will not be judged. Is that true? Just because you don't judge somebody, that doesn't mean somebody's going to judge you. People judge us all the time, don't they? You'll be treated as you treat others. Is that always true? That's not always true either. The standard used in judging is the standard by which you will be judged. Is that true? That's not always true. So, do you want to be judged that way? I don't think so. So, here's my interpretation of what he's talking about, because he's going to talk about multiple times in this text to judge people or discern, use discernment. All right? That's what we're going to call it, so they're judging. This is the call to be discerning rather than negative. This is the call to be uh, not use yourself as the measuring stick. You know, I'm better than you, I don't do this. I'm better than you because I don't do that. He's going to say that's hypocritical, and he's going to give us a, a beautiful illustration, kind of a funny illustration. And why do you worry about a speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own eye? What are you saying? There's a shortcoming, there's a sin, there's a problem in somebody else's head. It's a little one. 
He said, why are you worried about their little problem? Why are you judging them when you have a huge problem? He describes it as a log in your own eye. Can you even see if you've got a log in your own eye? You can't see. So how can you think of saying to your friend, let me help you get rid of the speck in your eye when you can't see the past the log in your own eye? I'm basically blind. Kind of silly, isn't it? It's funny. Made me think of this question. Did Jesus keep the law? Kind of a trick question. He drove the Pharisees, the religious leaders, crazy because he didn't do what? Keep their laws. You know, disciples picked some grain on a Sunday, and uh, he didn't wash his hands all the time, and different things like that. But the real answer, did he keep the law? God's law is absolutely, right? He's the only one that ever has. So he says, okay, if you're focusing on somebody else's little issue when you've got big issues, he's going to call you a hypocrite. You're two-faced. Not very pleasant. So he says, okay, first, get, deal with your issues. Get rid of the log in your own eye. And then maybe you will see well enough to help the person with the speck in your friend's eye. A friend, we're assuming he's requesting your help. And we should help one another, right? But we're not to be condemning others. And if we think we can <laughs> not have specks in our eyes, we're fooling ourselves. And then kind of an unusual verse, kind of difficult to understand. He says, don't waste what is holy on people who are unholy. Now, I interpret that to mean the, the beauty of the gospel. The fact that God loved you enough to send his son to die for you and me and rose from the dead to conquer death. And if I confess my sins and accept his gift of salvation, me and God are good. He said, don't waste that on unholy people. Well, everybody's uh, unholy. What is he talking about? Well, don't throw your pearls before the pigs or swine. He's Describing people that are unholy as pigs, which would be very uncomplimentary in a Jewish culture, right? They, they thought they were dis, despicable. Why? Well, he says they will trample the pearls, the gospel, and the good news, and then turn and attack you. I don't know if you've had, ever had this experience. You've been ever tell people about how much God loves them and they don't want to hear it. In fact, they attack you back. They, uh, they hate you. And Jesus said they're going to hate you if you're Jesus follower because they hated him. I haven't had anybody literally spit on me, but they spit on Jesus, and they could spit on us. Now, we're supposed to share the gospel with everyone, but if somebody says, eh, that's stupid, I don't want to hear it, let it go. The problem is we feel guilty, don't we? I must not have said the words right. If I had just explained it better, maybe they would have been more receptive. He says, no. You probably did a good job. Some people, and we're gonna, he's going to talk about this later, some people are just not going to accept the gift. Then he talks about prayer, and we talked about prayer last week, actually the Lord's Prayer, right? Describe this effective prayer. When you pray, you want your prayers answered, right? Okay, so he's going to tell us. Just keep on asking, and you'll receive what you ask for. There's going to be a caveat. Keep on seeking, and you'll find. Keep on knocking, and the door will be open to you. Be persistent. For everyone who asks, receives. Receives something. Seeks, finds. Everyone who knocks, the door will be open. Of course, who is the door? Jesus said, I am the door. So if you're seeking Jesus... He's not hiding. He's not making it hard for you to find him. If you just seek, you will find. Now, brings up a question, and he's going to discuss this a little bit later also. What about people who never hear? I got asked this question last Sunday after the service. What about people that never hear about Jesus? How did they get to heaven, or can they get to heaven? And I... I us preacher types want to say, well, it's only, Jesus is the only way, right? He said, I'm the way. But I got to thinking about a couple things. One, Old Testament, uh, 
Abraham, by faith, <laughs> entered in a relationship with God. Faith in the God he knew, Yahweh, right? Um, and then Romans chapter 1, Paul is talking about this issue about people that never heard about Jesus. And he said they have no excuse because they can, the implication is they can discover, have a, a, a saving relationship with God by just seeing the glory of nature. But the thing that really caught me when I thought about this was sometimes we treat our God as three gods. How many gods do we have? One. But we talk about him so much as God the Father, God the Son, and Holy Spirit, we almost act like there's three gods. So if you get to God through Yahweh, or Jesus, or the Holy Spirit, it's still the same God. So don't try and squeeze God in a box. That's my uh, analogy I like to use. Now, going on. Knowing God, having a personal relationship with God, requires a couple things. It requires faith. I already mentioned that, right? You have to believe. But you can't just believe and go away and forget it. You have to focus in on what you believe so that you can follow through. We're supposed to be Jesus followers, not Jesus faith people, but Jesus followers. So you keep on keeping on. You keep on seeking. It's not you sought. Keep on seeking. Keep on knocking. You enter into a relationship with God, you still keep seeking and knocking about his will for your life, and your, et cetera. Now, I give, all through here, he's going to give us illustration. So here's the illustration about this point. Parents. How many of you are parents? Okay, we've got parents here, right? I saw a bunch of kids up here. If your children asked for a loaf of bread, would you give them a stone? Of course, the logical answer is everybody's going to say, no, I'm not going to do that. Or if you ask for a fish, do you give them a steak? Of course, everybody's going to say, no. So as preachers like to ask questions, we could know what the answers are. All right? So you're all going to say no, right? Of course not, even in the text. Parents don't give bad, oh, good parents, we'll use the caveat. Good parents don't give bad stuff to their kids. Logical. Everybody got that, right? Makes sense. Now, a little caveat here. Sometimes God knows we are praying for snakes. I want to ask you how many of your prayers didn't get answered like the way you want it. Well, maybe, maybe. God does know better than you do. And something you've been asking for may not be good for you. So he goes on. So you sinful people, we're all sinful people, know how to give good gifts to your children, right? How much more? We can't comprehend how much more. Will your perfect heavenly father give good gifts to those who ask him? God only gives perfect gifts. So, on your outline, God has done then a perfect job with you. In fact, it would be insulting to God to say, to say that he did anything less than perfect with you. Now, you and I aren't perfect, but we get this, this idea, I think, that uh, since I still sin, I kind of have half of God. And I've got kind of half of salvation. And I've got half of the Holy Spirit. You know, some teach, churches teach, you know, you, you need to get a second blessing or you're going to need to get more of the Holy Spirit. And I always say, if the Holy Spirit's a person, you either got him or you don't, right? So God has done a perfect job with you. Then he talks about something called the golden rule. Most people knew that. One of our, our sons couldn't just quite get it right. <laughs> But uh, the fascinating thing about the golden rule is I was studying it. I heard this and I checked it out. A version of the golden rule goes back about 1,500 years before Jesus. So this isn't something original with him. Now, often it was stated negatively. Don't do to others what you don't want them to do to you. So let's read it the way Jesus used it. Do to others whatever you would like them to do to you. This is the essence of all this taught in the law. Notice that word, law and the prophets. So most religions of the world actually have the golden rule. Right. 
Funny thing is you can use the golden rule selfishly, can't you? Say, I'm going to do this for you so you will do it for me. Is that what Jesus intends? No, in fact, he, he equates it to the law, and we've already talked for two weeks about the purpose of the law is to do what? To teach you how bad you are. You can't get to God on your own. That's the purpose of the law, even the golden rule. Now, I try and practice the golden rule. That it can be used in a positive way. I shared this in the first service. The, uh, uh, the Morrisons who are new in town, we had a holiday, Labor Day, and I thought, well, they don't know anybody. Um, and so we invited them over to dinner. But the interesting thing was, I mentioned this in our, during dinner, and their oldest daughter said to me, what's the golden rule? And I said, well, it's, you know, and parents, you didn't do a good job of teaching it. Uh, but anyway, um, it's, you know, I, I like to say, especially with handicapped people and older people, I, I try and have this mindset. Well, it's kind of inconvenient for me to do this, but if I was handicapped or if I was, you know, too old to pick this thing up or whatever, I would want somebody to do it for me, so I'm going to do it for you. So this, it's not a bad thing in itself, but it's not going to get you to God, right? So I put it this way in your outline. Christianity is not about rule keeping, even the golden rule, as it's called, but about letting Jesus rule. And the neat thing about this is so much bigger, so much greater than, than the, the golden rule. So then he goes on and gives us another illustration. Talks about a narrow gate. Narrow gate. So he's like literally, literally going to say, this is the way you can get into God's kingdom. You can get into good standing with God. You can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. So there's a narrow gate and there's going to be another gate. The highway to hell is broad. Hell's a real place. People are going to wind up there, unfortunately. And its gate is wide, so it's easy to get there. Many choose that way. Many choose the easier way, I guess you would say, on this earth. But the gateway to life is very narrow, and the road is difficult. Now, this word difficult is translated lots of different ways. I don't think difficult is the best translation. Some translations don't even translate it. I think the best translation is restrictive. Uh, Old King James says straight. We've got this narrow, restricted gate. Why do I at, say is it di not difficult? Grace is not difficult. Grace is a free gift. We already talked about that, right? The difficulty is accepting somebody giving you a gift. Humbling yourself and, enough to admit to God that I, I can't make myself acceptable to you. That's the difficult part. But all you have to do is say yes to God and, you, and you're in. That doesn't take a lot of effort. So I put on your outline, does narrow actually mean difficult? Well, yes and no. Here's the reason. God front loads the gospel. What do I mean? It's too good to be true, isn't it? All I got to do is say yes to God and I get <laughs> forgiven for my sins, not just for past sins, present sins, future sins. I get to spend eternity with Almighty God and, and the glories of heaven and I hadn't done anything other than say yes to God. I get it all. I get indwelling Holy Spirit. I get it all right then at the beginning. Too good to be true, isn't it? And the other side is, can, can grace get wider? You know, we want to add things to grace, right? Yeah, I got into God's kingdom through his free gift, but now I got to do this. I've got to, you know, go to church. I got to give money to the poor. I've got to pray, I've got to change this bad habit. Does grace ever get any wider? No, it's already as wide as it needs to be. The other issue is this, it's on your outline. The reason salvation by grace doesn't cost us anything 
Is it because it cost Jesus everything? His death, and probably the worst part of his death was separation from the Father. I can't comprehend that, but. So, narrow gate. Then he talks about trees and fruit, and we live in a place where there's all kinds of trees that fruit, right? So this should be a good illustration for us. He says, beware of false prophets who disguise as harmless sheep but are really vicious wolves. Okay, so false prophets aren't just, uh, they're off track. They're dangerous, right? They're dangerous. Then he says, you can identify them. This is judging, right? Or discerning, our other word. You need to be discerning about these false prophets. How? Well, you can identify them by their fruit. That is the way they act. And he gives a simple illustration. Can you pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Now, I want to hear some of these I would consider false prophets. It's just, I listen to them for a while, and then I say, what? I uh, listen to a podcast that Chris was on, and I, what's that term? Open theism. Okay, I never heard this term before. I thought, this is, this is interesting. And I didn't watch much of it because, to me, <laughs> basically, he's a false prophet. Okay? Uh, he knew his Bible well, but he claimed, is, he said this, it's disingenuous to believe that God gives us choice and still knows the future. And I'm thinking, that's exactly true. Right? God gives us choice and know the future. But anyway, I was two and a half hours long. I listened about a half hour. I said, no, that's, that's enough. Maybe I would have learned some. I'm not sure I would have learned some more. But there, I, better stuff I could have listened to, I think. <clears throat> so we are to be discerning. We are supposed to identify false prophets. Had them in the Old Testament. Had them in Jesus' day. Unfortunately, we have... Lots of them even, t even today. He goes on with the illustration. Good tree, this is important. Good tree produces good fruit. Makes sense, right? Bad tree produces bad fruit. Makes sense. A good tree can't produce bad fruit, he reiterates. And a bad tree can't produce good fruit. So here's the question then. What kind of tree do you think you are? This is important. Because you do bad things. We all do bad things, right? So you can't be both. You can't be half good tree, half bad tree. So in God's eyes, when you enter in a personal relationship with God, you are now righteous, which means you're now a good tree. It's out of character for you to do something bad because you are a good tree. And if you think yourself as a good tree, and not half good, half bad, for me anyway, that's a motivation for me to do good things, right? Things that God would approve of. I have a big tree just five feet from the back of my house. Biggest tree on my property is an oak tree, all right? Now, is that oak tree partially oak and partially pine? Can it be any more oakly? O o whatever that would be. Oakly, yeah. And uh, oaky, oaky. It could it be any more oaky. That's probably the right word. No, it's an oak tree, and it gets acorns because it's an oak tree, right? Not pine cones. So it's really important that you and I understand when you're in Christ, you are a good tree, and you bear good fruit. We sometimes describe it as the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, and those things. The flip side is, so every tree that does not produce good fruit would be a bad tree, right? Chopped down and thrown into the fires. So if you're half good and half bad, half of you are going to be chopped away. It doesn't make sense, right? So just as you can identify a tree by its fruit, so you can identify people by their actions. Again, we, we're, we're judging, we're, we're discerning, right? 
by people's actions. I like to try and figure out their motives. And I said this in the first time, something that drives me crazy is the prosperity cult idea. Um, you know, these preachers that have million dollar houses and fly around in jets, maybe God wants them to do that. But if I'm a Jesus follower, if I'm going to be like Jesus, Jesus said he didn't have anything. Anyway, that's one of my little pet peeves. Sorry about that. Anyway, go on. True disciples. True disciples. This is a little scary. Not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, wait a minute. If I say, Lord, you're my Lord, 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 Lord. I'm not going to get there? Well, he explains, okay. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. So he uses the illustration of Judgment Day. All right? We're all going to have to face the Judgment Day. Uh, the books have to be balanced, right? And if you're not in Christ, it's not going to be a very pleasant judgment. In Christ, Jesus says, you, you know, God says, you can come in. <laughs> the blood of Christ makes it okay. On Judgment Day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name, and we cast out demons in your name. And I'm thinking, these guys are more spiritual than I am, right? And perform many miracles in your name. Now, the problem is this, and I put it on your outline. We say, they say, look what I did for you, God. Miracles, and casting out demons. And we can say, you know, I feed the poor, I do whatever you got, whatever we do. But Jesus' response would be what? Look what I did for you. That's the essence of the gospel, and that's the essence of Judgment Day. So he says this, I will reply, I never knew you. The Christianity is a personal relationship. It's not a religion. I have a personal relationship with Almighty God. I talk to him all the time. But these folks weren't talking to him. They didn't have a relationship. He says, get away from me, you who breaks God's law. We all break God laws, but the law of salvation by grace alone, they broke, right? They were trusting in their, their deeds rather than Jesus. So an old adage, and I put it on your outline, Jesus is more concerned about our walk our actions, than our talk. And people can talk a good talk, but their life doesn't display it. The, right, the, the fruit's not there. You ever met, ever met somebody that knows the Bible better than you, and you're just not very nice people? I, I, I wonder where the disconnect comes. God's more concerned about our walk, how we treat people. In fact, he said the essence of religion is loving God and loving other people, right? Then he fi finishes with a cool illustration because most of you know I build things. I built houses and helped build this church, literally, the structure. So here he goes. Anyone who listens to my teachings and follows it is wise. We'd all agree, right? Jesus' teachings are wise. Here's the illustration. Like a person who builds a house on solid rock. Harder to build, but you got a firm foundation, right? So the rains come and torments and floodwaters rise and the winds beat against the house. It won't collapse because it's built on bedrock, solid foundation. On the other hand, anyone who doesn't bring it up, anyone who doesn't, who hears, also hears, are we going to bring it up? <laughs> Anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey it is foolish. That makes sense too, right? Like a person who builds a house on sand. It's easier to build. The foundation is not too good, right? So when the rains and floods come and the wind beats against the house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. Now I want you to notice. <laughs> what do these guys have in common? They both heard the truth. 
right? They both heard the truth. They both were building something. We would say building a life. And they both had storms, problems come into their life. And then we're going to finish, and then we're going to look at what they had, what the difference was. So Jesus finished saying these things. Crowds were amazed at his teaching. That even we are today, aren't we? For he taught with real authority. He knew what he was talking about, right? Quite unlike the teachers of religious law. So back to these two guys. What was the difference between the two guys? It wasn't ignorance. They both heard. But it was ignoring Jesus. That was the problem. So, follow-up question. On what are you build on who are on what are you building your life? We're all building our life on something. If it's not Jesus, if you're ignoring Jesus, we'd strongly encourage you to accept him. But most of us are Jesus followers, so is there an area of our lives where we're ignoring him? Because his words are wise, and it's not wise to Ignore it. So evaluate. Evaluate your life. Every week we should do this. Pick an area, and maybe you're not being obedient. That was one of the things that came out. It was we were doing the baptismal videos. I, I mentioned that baptism is an act of obedience, and several people had said, Pastor Allen said it was an act of obedience. Uh, not that I said it. I quoted Jesus, of course. And so I'm going to be obedient. So begin to make those changes. Let me pray with you. Ah, Father God, thank you for your words. They truly are wise if we truly understand them. It's easy to pick something out here or there that seems to say this or that. What does it really mean? And we are all partially legalists. We want to get some credit for some things we do. But it's not us. It's all you, Jesus. And those of you who are contemplating or thinking about entering into a relationship with Jesus, we would encourage you to not let you put your head on a pillow this evening before you figure that out. And if we can be of any help, please be sure to ask. Father God, we thank you for your presence here. Continue to speak to us for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen.